Hey everyone. So in today's lecture, we are going to be looking at water and irrigation. So to start, why do plants need water? Well, as we've kind of talked about already, there are a number of processes that occur in our plants that require water. Right, and the first that we can look at is germination. So if you guys remember when we were looking at seeds, the first stage of germination is that imbibition of water. So our seeds are taking in water. And when that happens, it kicks off all these metabolic processes that then start happening that ultimately lead to germination, right? Or the end of germination, which is the emergence of the radical and ultimately the emergence of the seedling. So our plants need water for germination. They also need water for structural support. So if you had me in plant science, you'll know that in the interior of our plant cells, there's an organelle called the central vacuole. And this organelle holds water amongst other things. But as it fills up with water, it exerts pressure, referred to as turgor pressure, uh, in the cell. And what that does is it presses up the cell membrane up against the cell wall. And as it does this, it um, provide support to the cells and to the stem of our plants, right? Now, when there's not enough water, uh, those vacuoles uh, lose water and the cell membrane begins to pull away from the cell wall, and that results in wilting that we see in our plants, right? So you can see over here, you have a fully watered plant, and then one that needs water that is starting to wilt. And this is caused by these this lack of turgor pressure. So besides these direct characteristics that we see here, what also happens is it changes the growth of our plants. So when there is adequate water and there's this good turgor pressure, it causes the cell walls to elongate and your plants kind of grow bigger and taller. However, when there is a lack of water that we see here, it will cause your cell walls of your plant to get thicker and also stronger. So Sometimes um, practitioners will do this on purpose. It's something called drying down, where they will um, on purpose withhold water from a plant, and it will cause them to kind of grow shorter. Uh, it may also be beneficial in that hardening off process that we talked about. However, uh, there is a debate amongst that. Some people don't uh, kind of withhold water with hardening off. Others do. Um, so. Uh, water is important for structural support. It also makes up about 90% of uh, your plant. Um, so very important for structural support. It is also used for mineral and metabolite transport. So your plants have a vascular system um, which transports through them both water and minerals and photosynthate or sugars. Uh, and you can think of it like your circulatory system, right? Your veins and your arteries that transport blood and oxygen. So um, in order for um, minerals to make their way through the plant, which are important, and we learned about mineral nutrition, or for sugar to make its way through the plant, it needs to travel through the xylem or phloem vessels, the vascular system, and it needs to travel through the water that is flowing through there. So water is important for mineral metabolite transport. And very critically, uh, water is important for photosynthesis, right? So in the process of photosynthesis, our plants are fixing carbon. So they're taking carbon dioxide uh, from the air and turning it into a sugar molecule. And this process requires water, right? And also light energy. We talked a little bit about photosynthesis already. We mentioned that photosynthesis is the primary factor that determines the yield and quality of vegetables. Now, without adequate water, you will reduce photosynthesis. So what happens, um, and again, in plant science, we go into this a little more often, but how plants move water from the soil up throughout their bodies is through this process called the transpiration stream. So on the, uh, typically on the underside of leaves, there are pores or openings called stomata. 
And when they are open, they allow carbon dioxide to come in, so they allow for this photosynthesis. But it also allows for the transpiration, essentially the evaporation of water from that. And as that water evaporates, it kind of works like a straw. So it evaporates from these leaves and it pulls water up from the roots. And that's how this water continues to travel up through the plant. Well, if there is inadequate water, right, if our plant is sensing that there's not enough water, it releases a stress hormone called abscisic acid, and that causes the stomata to close. Now, when those stomata are closed, the plant is also not taking in carbon dioxide, so no more photosynthesis is occurring. And again, if we are concerned about our yield and quality of our vegetables, uh, we need photosynthesis to be occurring because that's ultimately going to determine those factors. So by having inadequate water, we're going to reduce photosynthesis. We're going to reduce the growth of our plant. We're ultimately going to reduce our yield. So water is critical for our plants. Now, I uh, want to talk a little bit here about water conservation. So we just mentioned how important water is for our plants. Now, agriculture accounts for approximately 70% of freshwater use worldwide, right? So the majority of our freshwater is being used for agriculture. Now, this is an issue if we um, realize that, you know, our population is increasing. And as our population increases, we need to increase our agricultural output in order to keep pace with all the new people, right, to make sure that they're fed. And then with disruptions that we're seeing in rainfall patterns and sea level rise, um, experts predict that we could see a water deficit of about 40 to 56 percent by 2030, right? So that is not good. Uh, so in order to deal with um, these issues of water loss, right? You, you hear all the time about drought and having to conserve water in various areas in California recently, right? So the problem is we are consuming too much water and not enough is being replaced, right? Either in underground aquifers or surface reservoirs, etc. So we should be mindful of water conservation in our practices, particularly in agriculture, because it uses up the most of our fresh water. Our fresh water. There are a number of ways that we are taking this into consideration. Right, the, probably the one of the primary methods is to reduce over irrigation. So to only provide enough water for plants that the water uh, only enough water for plants that plant the plant needs, right? And we can do this with um, advances in irrigation techniques that we're going to look at and advances in monitoring that we'll also talk about. And then if we are concerned with water conservation, uh, another thing that we can do is recycle water, right? Either we recycle our ir irrigation water, which is more common in a greenhouse setting, or we can even harvest rainwater, which I'll briefly talk about at the end of this lecture. So, you know, one of the ways, like I said, to um, help conserve water is to only provide enough water for the plant's needs, which brings up the question of how much water do plants actually need? Well, this is very plant specific, right? So different species have different water requirements, and this is based on how they evolved and where they evolved. So your beans are typically drought resistant, right? Your typical, your snap or your pole beans that you're going to, you would grow in a garden uh, are more drought resistant. So they don't require as much water. You know, tomatoes, squash, and melons, uh, they tend to develop a deep root system. So as a result, they're able to draw in moisture from deep in the soil. And as a result, they can often withstand drought, uh, particularly if, if they've had adequate water earlier in the growing season, right? So later on, they're better able to withstand some drought. Now, uh, your cold season crops, so your peas, lentils, and cabbage, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, etc., they um, are not, not drought resistant, so they need pretty steady water throughout their growing. Um, and then corn is as well, right? Corn and lettuce, they, they are uh, require or have larger water requirements. 
So we kind of have like general rules of how much water our plants require, but there is little uh, data on um, like quantified water requirements. So like particular, like how much water in liters, etc. We do have a study that was done or some work that was done at the University of Georgia and the University of Florida. And their researchers actually quantified the water needs for petunias. So they used soil moisture sensors to measure the volumetric water content of soil. And we'll look at soil moisture sensors in a bit, and we'll talk about volumetric water content, but essentially it is the percent of water in soil. And they found that for the peat light mixes, which are those typical mixes that we see in um, uh, in horticulture, right? The, when we talked about those soilless mixes, they're primarily made of peat. For those type of mixes, um, the capacity of water uh, that those mixes can hold is about 50%, right? So they can hold about 50% uh, uh, water. So if you're weighing that, it would be 50% water and 50% of this mix if they're fully um, watered. So then the researchers, what they did is they grew plants um, in different treatments of soil moisture from 5% all the way up to 40%. Right, so they had some plants that they kept the soil moisture at 5%, some at 10, etc. Uh, and what they found is that that 5 to 10% was about the lower limit of plant survival. So anything um, above, uh, anything below that, the plants would not survive, right? But they didn't produce high quality plants, they were just able to survive. Um, they saw a steady increase in plant growth as the amount of uh, water content in their soil or soilless mix incre increased up to about 25 percent. So about for, at 25 percent, 30, 35, 40, um, they didn't see uh, a lot of differences in their plant growth, right? They were all about the same and they found that they were able to produce uh, quality plants at about 20 percent soil moisture. And this turned out to about 16 ounces of water per plant over the course of three weeks or a little more than a tablespoon of water a day. So um, uh, one of the few studies that we have that actually quantified water needs for petunias, and this would be important if, again, we're trying to conserve uh, water and we're growing petunias, we now have a measure of how much water we would need to provide them each day. So I, I briefly talked about soil moisture meters and volumetric water content. So again, if we are looking to um, kind of maximize our water savings, we uh, have two ways of measuring soil moisture that would ensure that we're only going to uh, irrigate when it is required. So we have kind of two main types of meters. We have our soil moisture meters, which I kind of briefly talked about, that measure the volumetric water content, so the percent of water in our soil. And then we have tensiometers, which measure soil matric potential. Essentially what they're measuring is the amount of pressure it takes to extract water from the soil. So um, I want to talk about soil water availability. All right, and there's some important terms to know. I already kind of mentioned field capacity, if you see it down here, when we were talking about the peat light mix. But essentially, as um, your soil gets saturated, so we're in a field outside, it's raining, um, the water is filling up all the pore spaces in our soil, and we reach this saturation, so everything's full of water. And then some water now is being lost to gravity as it's flowing down through the soil. Well, eventually your soil will reach a point of field capacity, which all that water that is going to be lost from gravity is lost. And now you just have remaining water that is filling up these pore spaces. All right, so this field capacity is considered all the available water for plant growth. Now, as the soil dries, it gets harder for plants to intake water. This is because those water molecules start to adhere to soil pot, to uh, soil particles, right? So this, all these water molecules, they have a charge, right? And so do the particles in the soil. And those water molecules begin to adhere or kind of stick to these soil particles. 
So as this water decreases, the only water that becomes left is that which is strongly adhered to these soil particles and your plant can't take it in. And when you reach that point in the soil, that's called the wilting point. So essentially, if you want to know the difference between, or if you want to know how much water is available for plant growth in a soil, that is the difference between the field capacity here and the wilting point. So essentially all the water that you have when you have field capacity until you get down to this wilting point. Now, the field capacity of our soils is going to be determined by our soil texture. So I think we looked at soil texture already in a previous lecture, but it's essentially the percentage of clay, silt, and sand that make up a soil. And these percentages are going to affect the water holding capacity ultimately of your soil. And like we said uh, in, in the previous lecture, your sand has bigger particles, right? They're the biggest particles. Your clay is the smallest particles. And the bigger your particles, the bigger your pore sizes, and the more rapidly your water will flow through that soil. Right, so a sandy soil has very big particle spaces and the water is able to move through really quickly. Whereas a clay soil is going to have more water retention. So if we look at all these different soil types that you may find, and again, these are based, if we go back to this, these are based on the, all these different percentages. If you look at these different soil types, you'll see that they all have uh, generally a different field capacity. And again, that field capacity is the amount of water that that soil can hold. And their plant available water, so the water that is available for plants, so the difference between field capacity here and permanent wilting point is typically around 50% of field capacity. So if you look here up at sand, we have a field capacity of 10%, a permanent wilting point of 5%. So the amount of available water in this soil would be about 5% by volume. And that's kind of true across the board. Now, if you guys are interested, this is a general, uh, gives a general overview, but there's also a, um, if you want more detailed information, you can use this. Let's see if I can get to it. Oh, I can just click to it. Uh, so this is a little program that was developed and you can actually put in the percent sand and percent clay of your soil. You can get that by doing a, um, a soil test sending out to a lab, right? So if you if you wanted to go specifics of how much uh, what your soil type exactly is, say we sent it out to a lab and we have, uh, we'll say we're a sandy loam. So we have like 70% sand and 10% uh, clay. And then obviously we would then have 20% silt, right? Because that makes up the rest of it. This breaks down uh, the specifics of your field capacity and wilting point. And this is in centimeters cubed of water or in centimeters cubed soil, which is essentially the same as that volumetric thing. So here your field capacity would be 18%, um, right? And your wilting point would be 8% right there. So you can get more specific uh, if you were interested in looking at your actual soil. And if you, let me go back here. If you don't want to send your stuff out to the lab and you're just trying to um, kind of figure out what your soil would be uh, uh, by yourself, there are um, techniques that you can do by feel that will help you identify what type of soil you have. I do this when I was doing wetland delineations uh, for my previous job, I would do this all the time because as part of a wetland delineation, you need to determine what type of soil you have because that's going to affect your soil indicators. Uh, so in order to determine your soil texture by feel, the first thing is you want to see if you can form a ball with your soil, like they say here. And if you can't form a ball with your soil, you have sand. And that's going to pop up in a second, right? If you can't form a ball, it's some sort of other soil texture that you have. So then the next big thing is you try and form a ribbon with that ball, right? So you place just like he's doing like that between your thumb and forefinger and you try and form a ribbon and you see 
um, if you're able to form that or not, right? And if you can't form a ribbon at all, it's going to be classified as a loamy sand. If you can form a ribbon, uh, the actual soil texture is going to be determined by how long that soil ribbon is. Right, so you can see that one, it's not too long. Right, so less than 2.57 meters, it's a type of loam. Between that, it's a type of clay loam. And if you get a really long ribbon, it would be considered a type of clay. And let me see, let me speed this up because so then next step, you're going to determine if your soil is gritty or smooth. So you wet it, rub it in your hand. If it feels um, gritty, it's gritty. If it feels smooth like flour, you can classify that as smooth. And if it's kind of in between, it would be in between. And then um, if you know you have a type of loam, right, and it feels gritty, you, you would classify it as sandy loam. If it's smooth, you'd call it a silt loam. Either gritty or smooth, you just call it a loam. Right? And you can do this with your type of loam. You could do this with your type of clay loam, right? And you can do it with your type of clay. And so these through these soil textures, uh, or through this method, you can get an idea of what your soil texture is. And then you can use this handy triangle here and put in what you think the percentage of each is, or you can just go back to your table here. Uh, wrong one. Oh. Uh, you go back to your, where's my table? You go back to here, and that'll give you an idea of your field capacity and your wilting point. Okay, guys, okay, let's calm down. Okay, so, uh, a little bit about um, soil water availability in your soils. Now, to actually measure uh, that volumetric water content, you can use these soil moisture meters, right? And there's very different, there are a bunch of different types, types that you can buy. And these are helpful because, again, if we're trying to um, not over irrigate, they will provide information on when you should start irrigating your field, right? So typically you're going to want to start irrigating when your soil reaches 50% of available uh, soil water, right? And again, that available soil water is the difference between your field capacity and your wilting point. So say you have a field capacity of 28% um, percent and your wilting point is 14%. That means you have 14% of plant available water, right? So as you get to, as you lose 7% of your water, right? That would be about 50%, and that would equal about 21%. Um, as you lose that, once you get to that point, you're going to want to start irrigating your field again. So these soil moisture meters are helpful in uh, <laughs> being surrounded by animals in uh, being able to um, better uh, time your irrigation. Now, besides these soil moisture meters that measure this volumetric water content, you also have these tensiometers, which are measuring the metric potential, right? And that's the amount of pressure it takes to extract water from the soil. So again, that's based on that idea as your water is lost from the soil the remaining water, it gets harder for that to be drawn up. So they measure uh, from zero to 100 centibars. So they're measuring pressure. And you'll see that at zero, you have saturated soil. If you get a measurement of 10 to 25 based on your soil texture, that's considered field capacity. And anywhere from 70 to 80 is a dry soil. And what's nice is that there are guidelines for different crops. Okay, buddy, hold on. Hold on. Give me one second here. My dog is trying to get off the couch. Okay. Sorry about that. So there are guidelines for different crops that would, if you are using these, it would let you know when you're going to want to start irrigating, right? So for corn, if you're getting between 50 and 80, you're going to want to make sure you're irrigating. And then uh, I just wanted to show um, 
a couple things. All of this technology is advancing rapidly. Um, nowadays, these meters are hooked up to your smartphone, right? So you can install a meter in the field or in a greenhouse, and you'll get your data right on a smartphone. They're also doing work with drones and satellite imagery to identify soil moisture. Um, and then they're even doing work um, with, this is ultrasonic spectrosc spec spectroscopy? Spec something along those lines. Um, where they're actually putting leaves of your plant uh, between that and they're able to measure uh, directly the, the plant itself to see if it needs water or not. And then some of your, um, in your uh, article this week, it'll talk about some more uh, methods that they're doing for both measuring soil and then trying to conserve water. Okay, so going back to how much water do plants need, right? Say you don't have any of those uh, meters and you're trying to figure out you have a greenhouse or you're growing um, indoors and you're trying to figure out how much uh, what are do my container plants need? Well, what you can do is you can thoroughly water your plants in the morning, right? And then let them drain for about 30 minutes. And then you weigh your pot. And then you come back a day later, right? So 24 hours later, and you weigh your pot again. Now, the decrease in weight is the amount of water that was used by that plant during the day. Uh, and that's going to give you a measurement of how much water that plant needs each day. Now you can repeat this process throughout the growing cycle because uh, how much water a plant uses is going to be affected by environmental factors, right? So whether it's sunny or cloudy or warm or cool that day, and the size of the plants, right? So as the plant gets bigger, it generally requires more water. Uh, but what is nice is by doing this, you can get an idea of how much water your plants need. And then you can measure the amount of water produced by an irrigation system, right, such as your greenhouse, right? You can lay out uh, some pots, line them in plastic, uh, and let them sit there for a day and measure how much water they, they actually get. And then you can adjust your irrigation system to make sure that the amount of water that's being produced is equal to um, what your plants need, right, and not anymore if we're trying to conserve water. So with that, that brings us to irrigation. And irrigation is simply the watering of plants by artificial means. So we have a lot of different types of irrigation, um, both that can be done in a field and in a greenhouse. So um, we're going to start by looking at surface irrigation, or sometimes it's referred to as flood and furrow irrigation. Now this is probably the oldest type of irrigation that we have. Uh, it's cheap and it's low tech. And essentially, your farmers are just flooding their fields, uh, particularly through small trenches that are built into the field. Like I said, this is cheap and low tech, but it's not water efficient. So you can lose up to 40% of your water to either runoff or evaporation, right? So that water is going to run off that field uh, or maybe um, will evaporate as it sits on those trenches and it's not getting into your plants. Now we have um overhead sprinklers and again this is can be done in a greenhouse that you see here or a field with like a central pivot system that are pretty common now these produce a mist or droplets over the crop now this is a little more um water efficient than your uh, surface irrigation and it uses about 30 to 40 percent less water than surface irrigation but again it's subject to um uh, water evaporation and other factors, and you wind up losing about 20% of your water. Uh, so again, 20% of your water that's not going to your plants. So um, recently, drip irrigation has become uh, more popular. And in this method, you are using these um, hoses or tubes to provide water directly to your plant roots. Right, so these run down. If you're in a greenhouse, they run down into each individual pot, and you're providing, uh, you're delivering water at a steady, uh, low pressure. And again, it's going directly to your plant roots, so you're not getting um, those losses of runoff or evaporation that you may see with other types of systems. Right, so compared to sprinkler systems with drip irrigation, you can see water savings up to 30 to or even 50 percent. 
Uh, another nice benefit of drip irrigation is that your foliage right, remains dry, so it reduces the risk of any sort of disease that you may get as a result of wet foliage, like a type of rot or wilt that you may see, right, or fungal infection. Now, uh, as I said, this can be done in a greenhouse, it can be done in small scale, and then they've even adapted drip irrigation for our uh, center pivot irrigation, uh, and they just run tubes down. And this could be mobile, and it irrigates as it goes. And as an example, they did here, they showed what's done when they're using typical sprayers, and you see all this excess water that is um, uh, that you see here. And then this is right after they've done drip irrigation and you don't see that excess water, right? So that's the, the water savings that you're seeing. And here's just a link that I have down here. Uh, and I'll just highlight it in case you're just watching this. Um, that is an older article, but it has methods on um, doing these drip irrigation systems, particularly for uh, more small scale. Now, in a greenhouse, if we're talking about other types of irrigation methods, we have what are called capillary mats. So these are essentially highly absorbent mats, or they have a highly absorbent core, and they're surrounded by uh, polyplastic. Now, these mats are placed uh, on the floor on a, a bench, and your pots are placed on top of them, and you water the mats, and those they remain uh, wet, and then the water is gradually wicked up, uh, through the bottom of the plot, uh, the pots, right? Openings in the bottom of the pots. Kind of similar to the wicks that we're using in our fast plants. Now, uh, a con of this method is that these mats over time can grow algae and attract gnats and they can become unsightly. However, a uh, professor, he used to be a professor at Auburn, developed a method where he uses just sheets of newspaper, about seven to 10 sheets of newspaper, has the same same function and then in about 10 weeks he composts that newspaper and with that method he doesn't get any algae or gnat issues so another type of potential watering system that you could use and then the last that we're going to look at are our ebb and flood systems our flow systems and in these systems we are flooding either a bench or flooding the uh, floor of our greenhouse with uh, water, and typically we would have a uh, fertilizer included as well. And then that floods through the bench, uh, that water is taken up by the plants, and then any excess water is returned to a reservoir uh, that's going to hold this, this uh, irrigation water. So this is a nice system, again, because um, it is conserving water, so any excess gets kind of brought right back into the system. Which leads us to our last topic that I'm going to briefly talk about, rainwater harvesting. So if we are trying to conserve water, one of the ways that we can do that is by harvesting rainwater that falls. Right? And, uh, we can use rain barrels or big cisterns that you've seen here. There are, they've uh, developed these kind of upside down umbrellas that catch rainwater. Now there are considerations that you need to take into account, particularly if you're using, um, you're trying to capture water coming off the roof, like your roofing material needs to be a certain type. But there are a lot of resources online and I would encourage you guys to check them out if you are interested in doing this type of thing. Again, it's a it's common, this was done uh, throughout history in the Middle East in Rome, and it's uh, more popular now in Australia, particularly because they have uh, so many drought conditions there. But another thing to be aware of, and for uh, if you guys are interested, I would encourage you to investigate it. So that is that. Uh, I will talk to you guys another time.